I'm sure you've heard me talk about 26shirts.com before, but just in case you haven't, let me fill you in. At 26 Shirts, they sell different limited edition sports-themed t-shirts every two weeks. After a shirt's prospective two-week run is over, the design is retired and never sold again. They are operating out of Buffalo and now also offer options in Chicago. For every shirt sold, $8 is donated to a family in need. Not to a major charity or foundation, but to an actual family or individual in need. To show our support here at Chasing Cinema, when you buy a shirt, we will automatically put you into a drawing to win the next shirt free. That's right. You buy a shirt, $8 goes to help a family or individual in need, and you get a shot to win the next shirt absolutely free from Chasing Cinema. So go to www.26shirts.com and buy a unique Buffalo Sports Design t-shirt, help a great cause, and also get entered to win the next shirt absolutely free. Again, that's 26shirts.com because you have the ability to help a complete stranger just because it's the right thing to do. www.26shirts.com. Help someone now. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to ChasingCinema.com's official podcast. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button on iTunes so each week our brand new episode directly comes to your account. It'll go on your iPod, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever electronic device you're listening to our podcast on, it comes immediately to you. Uh, if not, you're not an iTunes fan, you're not an Apple big fan, it's okay. Go to YouTube.com slash Chasing Cinema, and our podcasts are all there. Last week, we had the great opportunity to speak with uh, young aspiring filmmaker Sean Otsubo about his film and his work and today instead of looking towards the future we're going to take a trip to the past and look at a film uh, that was from 1927 I believe and see why restoration is so important and why I'm such a huge lover for silent film. Today I have a guest to help us talk about that and talk about the processing of transferring a movie or not necessarily tra- transferring a movie and more or less preserving a film. Uh, he's been on many times, and most of the time we have talked about silent film. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Krauss, sir, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on again. You're a third time back on the podcast. Yep. And uh, we are glad to have you, and we want to just talk about what you've been doing, and um, we're going to get all into that. But first, of course, the only topic to start off with is what have you been watching lately? Uh, well, I uh, have a lot of things backed up on my DVR, and so I'm trying to get to them after a pretty turbulent last two years. Um, the most recent film that I saw, and this shouldn't surprise after that introduction, that is actually it's a silent film, but it's one of the really great ones, um, one of the really great ones um, ever made from, from the 1920s and the teens. And um, in fact, it was a film that was one of the most uh, seen or watched of the entire silent period. In fact, going all the way to Gone with the Wind, the name of the film is called the Big Parade was released in 1925. It was an um, MGM film. It starred uh, John Gilbert and Rene Adderay. They were a screen team. That was the first of their films together. And um, um, the, the print of it that's available um, is renowned, meaning that what we have um, uh, of it today is uh, almost without blemish. And so if you were to look at reviews of the, the transfer that was done about a year or two ago, you will only read rave reviews and and um, and, and justifiably so. What's the big parade about, and, and why is it so captivating? And and um, and and it has a whole army uh, of a fan base of people who absolutely love this movie. <clears throat> well, I, I start by saying it's it's a long film. It is truly an epic film. Um, MGM put a lot of money into this movie. They had also the cooperation of the U.S. Army in, in, a, in a base in Texas. And it came um, about, what would it be? It would be about seven years after World War I. And so um, just as the 1920s saw a spate of films in Europe and the United States, <clears throat> excuse me, about World War I, just as we started to have that in America and in Hollywood following the Vietnam War, and starting in the late 1970s here, with films like The Deer Hunter and Coming Home and others, <clears throat> The Big Parade, um, like I said, it's a mammoth of a film. It's two and a half hours at least. And the first half of the film 
centers around uh, uh, John Gilbert's character, who is a rich kid who signs up for the war, uh, doesn't really know what it's about, and goes over to France. And he's there, and about, like I said, the first half, he it's just a kind of episodic film um, because the men in, in his, uh, that he's with, or the soldiers that he's with, are waiting to go to the front. And uh, and there's all these little adventures, and John Gilbert falls in love with this French girl who doesn't speak any English, and he doesn't speak any French. Uh, with his buddies, some some comical things that happen, um, and um, it's uh, there's an amazing amount of long takes where the camera, I swear, it doesn't move for like five minutes, and that happens several times. But anyway, you're getting to know these characters. And, um, you know, their, their comradeship and, uh, falling in love and being the, um, the outsiders in a particular culture, this, this, this being rural France. And it's leisurely, which is a sin in film today, except for maybe Terrence Malick or certain foreign directors. Um, and it's leisurely. And then there's a reason for all this, which really hits you. As you go into the second half, and it hits you immediately, and that is, as they go into battle. And remember, this is the this is World War One, so there's trench warfare, um, where they're trying to move up the line by ten feet or something, and it takes a month to do so. Um, it's harrowing. Um, you you are you are with these men, particularly three principal men, but you're with these men. As they are moving through the forest, and there are snipers everywhere, um, and it's it's real. Um, no wonder critics and audiences were united in raving about this movie, because um, it dares to per, to show you the whole story. What I mean by that is, it shows you. Before going into the war, this young man's life, it shows you during the war, and without giving anything away, of course, it shows you once he returns home. And the poignancy of watching it today, much less a 1925 audience, which for which that had just been recent history, in which there were many people in the audience uh, that had been soldiers and had either come back with some kind of mental trauma, which always happens in every war, come back without a leg or without an arm or an eye um, that had had mustard gas and that had changed them, um, where people hadn't come back, um, and you know, families and lovers that had been through that with their men. Um, it's an extraordinary movie. I, I just I, I I can't rate it high enough. The director, by the way, is King Veter. And um, who had a long career in Hollywood, all the way to the 1980s, from the silent era to the 1980s. And um, I highly recommend it. And if you don't understand why I brought him on now, then you must not be listening. Because usually people say, I saw this. It was good. But like when he first spoke to me when we and I worked at Hyde Video and we first met, he really knows how to paint a picture and really bring you into a film in a, in a more depth level. And I appreciate every time you talk about a film... Um, uh, Duel in the Sun. That reminded me of Duel in the Sun. I was a big fan of, uh, you know, that film, and uh, King Vitor did that film as well. Um, now we just recently passed the Oscars. I don't know how much you saw or, or what you didn't see, but have you? Uh, what about the uh, films from 2014? Did you have a favorite movie of the year? Did you get to see a lot of the um, Academy nominated films? Um, I, I saw a fair number of them, and I actually saw the awards. In fact, I haven't ever missed the awards since I was a, a very young person. I don't know if that's an if that's an honor or if that's a, an, a sign of, of, of a bit of stupidity. I don't know which. You, <laughs> the audience can make up their mind. Um, I um, I did see a fair amount of, um, but certainly not, I, I could have seen a, a heck of a lot more of 2014 films, and I really missed out on seeing uh, the foreign films, which to me seemed um, from everybody that I, I trust, whose opinion I trust and the re and the reviews and the, and you know, the personal, you know, the individual's friends and who are critics, um, those were seemed to be the films to go after. And what I mean by, for example, is the film Ida, which is the Polish film that did win the Oscar um, for foreign film. 
And um, it was wonderful to read that the foreign film winner was actually almost certainly deserved, although it, this year, as in the last couple of years, it's been, it, was, it was in good company. Um, because uh, almost any one of those films, or at least three out of five of the, of the films nominated in that category, uh, could have been winners easily. One was by more, was a film that was um, um, an entry for the first time ever from this little country which you may never even heard of that's the size of, I believe, Texas or larger in the northwest of Africa in the Sahara called Mauritania. And it was a movie called Timbuktu, and it's um, um, a devastating film about the effects of uh, religious fundamentalism on um, the people of a region and how you know a group like ISIS, although it's not ISIS, moves in and terrorizes the people. Uh, the third film that got a lot of praise, which again, I haven't seen this film, I, I can't wait to see it, is Leviathan, which is a film from Russia and um, a very bleak film by all accounts, by a very bleak director by all accounts. And so I would have liked to have seen those. Um, um, the ones, uh, th there was no film I saw that it, from last year, of a last year's film, that impressed me as, as one from 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, 2013, which was the movie Her um, <clears throat> by Spike Jones. I, I cannot talk enough about. I'm even I'm even searching for words <laughs> right now. Um, the any, whatever words I say are so banal. I mean, I mean, you can say outstanding, superb, terrific, you know, and those are just those just don't mean anything. That film I thought was one for the ages. It wasn't just oh a good film from 2013 or for the 21st century or contemporary movies. It was good no matter what period you were looking at movies from. Um, but I found no film that, that equaled that. Um, I would say the closest that I came, perhaps, but it, it doesn't equal it, is the film The Immigrant, um, which also stars Joaquin Phoenix, who was the, one of the stars, of, the main star, protagonist of Her. Um, but it also it's a, it has, it's a, uh, has a trio of stars. So it's Joaquin Phoenix, it's uh, Marion Cotillard, who is outstanding and who is shot by its director, um, filmed, I should say, uh, by its director, exactly as if she was in a silent film. And I have not seen that in a movie since a silent film, or, or at least a long time. And the third person uh, that was in that is the chap that was in, um, sorry, I can't think of his name. He was in The Hurt Locker. Jeremy uh, Renner. Jeremy Renner. And they're all, they're, there's this... Um, you know, very warped triangle, a love triangle. And it's it shines a light on a thing that is just never covered in American history. And that is how hard it was for people to immigrate from Europe and go through Ellis Island and do it legally in the early part of the 20th century, just the turn of the century. And basically the hell that they went through and I think that all of our, you know, July 4th and, you know, uh, American history books and, you know, they, they, they paper over um, the misery these people went through if they were even able to, to enter into the country. And um, I recommend that. Well, that's the one I would pick out. The immigrant. Oh, uh, Louis, actually, our co uh, my co-host, saw that film, and he really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, I've still not seen that film. Um, but I did see uh, Ida or Ida. Um, oh, and lucky I, you. Yeah, Good. And, I, and I, that's on Netflix right now. And, okay. Um, I thought that film um, was one of the first films I've seen in the longest time that uses black and white to not only use it as a visual, you know, um, an eye catcher. To help tell a story and, and blocking and you know not you know it's so rare that we actually have time to well not have time but actually concentrate on a movie's blocking or its its use of color you know it, it always goes performance story and the usual ones that everyone always tackles but that movie uses every element so beautifully um it was definitely a wonderful movie and um great great so hopefully when you get a chance you get to watch it um so last we were talking to you you, you had done a uh, piece for film international and um you know we we know that you're always working on stuff so what's 
Um, besides the project we're going to be talking about, I know you've got some things in the works. I don't know what you could exactly talk about. You can't, but what, what's, what have you, what's been, uh, keeping Dr. Krauss busy? Uh, as always, teaching keeps me busy and putting a lot of thought and care. I mean, I'm still one of those teachers that, that until maybe the summer, this coming summer is resisting online courses. I really believe in-person courses where you have the human interaction, um, to me is invaluable and I would hate to see that leave our culture and it's leaving. I, I doubt if it will ever leave, of course, but, um, I, I put a lot of time on my courses and, and, you know, I, I, I have a certain pride in that. But besides that, I, I'm started working on an article that if any of my friends will, will be listening to this, will groan because, um, and shake their heads because it's something, it's a project I've been at work on, um, for, too many years to mention, um, and it's centered around a 1944 American masterpiece. It's one of those uh, maybe 50 films that have ever came out of Hollywood ever that one must see, and it's called Meet Me in St. Louis, and it was a Vincent Minnelli film. It's got an ensemble cast, though it's headed by Judy Garland, and it's often said of that film, I'm not the first person ever to say this, but it's it's her least neurotic performance and it's um it's it's one of those films that that i think like the searchers john ford's the searchers although the searchers is known as a film that um is famously um erratic um a famously um splits audiences and critics as to what the film is really about i mean it's it's kind of known for that now but Meet Me in St. Louis, to me, is like that film, although it doesn't have that reputation. So on the one hand, you have people, quite a few, quite a lot of critics and ordinary people and audiences that have a certain image of the film as glowing and nostalgic and, you know, um, family values, if you want to use that expression. Um, you know, um, very sunny. And then there's another group, very distinguished group, a smaller but distinguished group, who argue the film is a much darker take on the American family and of, um, of what it, what it means to grow up in a patriarchal society an old fashioned, that is nuclear family society, um, within a certain prominent model of heterosexuality. I, I don't mean to go on like a cultural studies, um, sociological approach, although that's part of it. It's more getting at the meaning. What is this movie about? Um, because it has certainly areas of light and dark, and, and they aren't little. I mean, they're, when they're light, they're really light. And when they're dark, they're really dark. And so, you know, what is this film trying to say? And the reason why I've been trying to work on this for the longest time was that I had not really come to an adequate conclusion. Is this movie, you know, the, the one side or is it the other? And now I think I've got an answer on that. Okay, wonderful. So, um, we always, I'm always checking in with Dr. Krauss. So when we know more of when that date of the article will be coming out, cause it's not set yet, um, you know, we will keep you posted. And if he's not too busy, cause I know he's always going on adventures and doing fun stuff, uh, we'll try to have him back on, uh, to remind all of you that his article is coming out. Um, but beyond that, if that's not, you know, as awesome as that sounds to you, Jeff Krauss is doing something very, very important. And, um, Something truly amazing, and I honestly have we've been haven't got a chance to really speak lately, so I'm not even sure how this project came about. So I'm going to be listening for the first time, just as you do right now, and how this project and how we got involved with this film that I mentioned last week. If you were listening, very briefly. Um, and by the way, excuse any sounds that you hear. We are actually in UNLV's um, viewing center, where students in other rooms are watching um, some of the UNLV short film archive, um, and which is awesome. And we wrote an article on that at the UNLV Rebel Yell. You could check that out. Um, but seems like you guys aren't hearing too much. But just in case you do, don't be alarmed. Um, so, Dr. Krauss, tell me the origin story of how you got involved in this restoration project process. Okay. I'll well, not the- process, but at least at least found this film because, you, you know, Right. Um, well, it's it's a remarkable story. I'll even say that. Um, um, I, I, this started off as a project which is still in action, um, writing about Clara Bow and her husband Rex Bell, and their their specifically their life in Nevada when after she moved from um, um, and, and quit Hollywood in 1931, um, would return only to make two more films. 
while her husband's career actually would go up. And they bought a, a huge ranch. Uh, I think it's like a half million acre ranch in 1931 when hardly anybody lived here in Southern Nevada. And uh, they built a, a magnificent uh, house, raised a family. And, um, and then she eventually moved to California in 19, around 1950. They moved back into, they moved into Las Vegas in 45. So my, um, my research is, is um, about the 14 years, basically, that they were at the Walking Box Ranch, which was the name of their place. And uh, sorry to interrupt you, but last we spoke to you, you were working on a book composing all that information. Yes. And so, and so, and then, I, you know, of course, with any, you know, historian, you're, you're, you're trying to find, if they do exist, any um, person who might have known the people that you're covering. And uh, Clara Bow died uh, when she was a, a fairly young woman. She was only 60 when she died in 1965. Still, the people that um, would have known her, most of them are gone. So um, when I got contracted for this project, and it began as a project from UNLV, um, and they, they just, one of their first questions to me over lunch was, um, was there anybody around that worked with her in movies? And I, I just, you know, my first reaction, and I said it, was I, you know, I highly doubted that because her last movie was in 1933. So, um, but, you know, obviously I'll look. And as a matter of fact, at that time, I did find, um, I soon found two people that knew her. One was a, a screenwriter who worked on, did three of her movies in the 1920s. And that woman was uh, 111 years old. Um, 109 or 111, I believe she was 111. And in fact, she was the the oldest person, I believe, at the time in California. I I, I found out where she was located, and uh, it was in San, in San Diego, and, and she just was very near death. And soon enough, she did die. The other person, however, was a woman named Diana Sarah Carey. And in 1924, she was one of America's biggest stars, I, I kid you not, Um uh, as a as a as a child actress, she was like the pre Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple, in fact, Shirley Temple would actually remake some of her movies a decade later. Um, she was known as Baby Peggy at the time. In nineteen twenty, uh, what year was that? It was yeah, it was twenty four. Clara Bow, who was just starting off in movies, co starred uh, in a film that starred Baby Peggy, or now known as Diana Sarah Carey. And uh, so I, I looked up Carrie, who is still alive. Uh, as we speak, she's 96. She'll be 97 next fall. And she, uh, without going off on her and all that, anyway, she remembers everything. And she told me what her memories <clears throat> of Bo. And then that led to another thing. That led to, well, how many silent film performers are even alive anymore? And so um, the answer to that question is there's three that I know of. There's Diana Sarah Carey. There, the, there's another one named Lassie Lou Ahern, who will be 95 um, this June. And then there is a woman named Jean Darling. They're all women, who's 92, and currently lives and has lived for a long time in Ireland. Um, and so... And, sorry to interrupt you again. And, and is this just performers, or is this behind and This is just camera? performers. Okay. And that's the way it would actually have to be mm-hmm. because these, these kids were kids. Kids, yeah. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you were in production, then you were at least like 20, 20 or something, yeah. you know, okay. You could have been 60. Mm-hmm. So those people aren't around anymore. Yeah. Um, Three, and so wow, what, what blows my mind, um, what blows my mind is that, you know, we had basically um, the silent era for around 40 years, let's say 35, 40 years. The first film ever made was in England in 1888, okay? And silent films disappeared in America by around 1929. Now, they would disappear in other countries uh, a little bit later, like in Mexico or in Russia or in England, because the technology, there was a little bit of a lag. And so, um, so that's, therefore, therefore, there's a woman in Mexico who's 102 or 103, and she's still living. And in in the first Mexican talking movie, and, and anyway, so we're we're nearing the end of a huge divide, 
let, let me put it in other words. Okay, let's pretend we have somebody out there that's listening that, that's really into history, just history, and say like uh, Civil War history. Let's say the Battle of Gettysburg. And so you're going to do a documentary or a book about the you know, Battle of Gettysburg. So, you know, you're out there, you're filming, and then you find out there's one person, because this is impossible now, but there's one person still alive who's a veteran of that battle. Now, the last Civil War veteran died a long time ago. But let's pretend this was years back, and you had, you had the last one that you could, you could, you know, show photos to, ask their opinion, ask their remembrances, ask, you know, what, what part they played, how the battle went, what happened after the battle, how, you know, their life before the war. You could have that person to go to, okay? In silent film, we have these three people that are still living, and you know they're in their nineties. And once they're gone, and I want them to be around as long as possible, I really do. But once they're gone, what is now still a living history will simply be history. We won't have any contact. The door will be closed. And so I feel, um especially blessed, I, there's no words for it, to, to, to think that I'm in contact with the remaining players. Now, once, I, what where this led was, I, I, I did an article on Baby Peggy or, or, or um, uh, Diana Sarah Carey. And which we interviewed you for. We, yes, yep. exactly. So then that led me to the next person, which uh, who is, as I mentioned before, is uh, Lassie Lua Hearn. She lives not that far away from, from the Las Vegas area. She lives in uh, Prescott, Arizona. And I contacted her, and, and, uh, and just the same way with, with, as, as Diana, she has her full memory intact. She remembers absolutely m most everything. And um, so I drove over and interviewed her on September one. 2013, and I recorded on a camcorder. Subsequently, that was, um, um, you know, transcribed, and that will be coming out in a in a magazine issue this spring at some point, very soon. And um, so, with Lassie Lou Hearn, um, let me let me talk about her. So that this will set up the principal reason why I'm even having this this conversation with you, uh, meaning my project. Um, Lassie Lou is, um, she was discovered at the age of 18 months by no less than Will Rogers. Now, if you're a young person, that may, may unfortunately mean very little or nothing to you. But if you're older than that, if you're middle-aged, and especially if you're a senior citizen, Will Rogers was one of, and this is no exaggeration, in the first half of the 20th century, it looms as one of the principal figures in American life. Um, and anyway, I, I'll just say that, and then if you want to read more, go on about what made him so special. She was discovered by him at, at 18, month, 18 months, and she started appearing in films with him, and then that led to other things. And, and this is how extraordinary her career was. It led to such things as not only being his short comedies, but also those of a guy named Charlie Chase, and Charlie Chase was with people like, um, you know, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton um, and, and many other figures, Harry Langdon, Harold Lloyd, um, and Baby Peggy, um, was one of the great comedic figures, not only in Hollywood, but, but anywhere in the world in the 1920s, slapstick. And so, um, and she appeared in several of them. And then, to talk about how diverse and interesting her career was, and I don't know, Jake, if you even know about this kind of stuff, um, and, and, and if you don't, it, it's, it does, it's not that much in our history book. So, but let me, and that is, um, in the night, in the teens and twenties, um, was the greatest era for women in, in film so far. They had more choices. They had more roles. They were more behind the camera, in front of the camera. And there were women action figures. There were women who starred in movies and they were always serials and they did their own stunts and they did amazing stunts and one such name was Helen Holmes and um, anyway she appeared with Helen Holmes in two serials uh, and then she was also in big production movies uh, and some of those movies are lost today so that means she's the only link 
to a movie that we don't even have anymore. Okay, so one of them is a John Ford film in 1925. One of them is a movie that starred Ronald Coleman in 1925 and Vilma Bankey. I mean, and she's she's it. Um, the movie's turned to dust, or maybe hopefully it's hidden away and will be found by some lucky person soon. Um, and then she uh, appeared with other people. Um, she was in the second or third or fourth uh, biggest epic budgeted movie. In America, in the 1920s, a movie called Uncle Tom's Cabin, and hopefully you know that by the by the novel that it comes from. It was this huge. Um, ver- uh, it took two years to make this movie, and she played a principal supporting part in that. She's got a big role in that, and other movies. I'm not going to go through all the as interesting, at least to me, as they would be. Hopefully, the listeners. The the point I'm getting to is now this. The last silent film that she made was called uh, Little Mickey Grogan. It's a very Irish title. And um, it came at the tail end of silent films in December 1927. She never saw her movie. Ever. That you think, well, that's weird. It's not weird. Because in 1927, movies played at a cinema for a week. And that's it. There's no DVD. There's no Netflix. It's like, well, and so these people didn't see their movies again. And so um, when I interviewed her um, a couple years ago, she asked me at the end if, 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 you know, if I knew if her movie existed anymore, Little Mickey Grogan. And I said, I, you know, I don't know. So I, I did a lot of looking. And I found out, in you know, looking that is in the world's great film archives, and you know, Library of Congress, the you know, the BFI and British Film Institute, and many others. Um, and I found out there there was in a huge, um, very famous archive in Paris, um, owned by Lobster Films, um, and they had a copy of it there. They had an original nitrate camera negative. Wow. Okay, it's just sitting there. So I contacted its very famous CEO, a guy named uh, Serge um, Bromberg, very famous in the field. And he wrote me back this long email. Thank God he speaks English because I don't speak French or I'll write French. And um, he just got very blunt with me. Um, and he said, oh, let me just tell you, I have 100,000 canisters of film in this archive. A hundred thousand. We have a small staff here and a small budget. So what we have done, obviously, is to um, is to rank the films that they most need saving in their opinion by importance. And so they at that time it's done now. But at that time when I first contacted him, they were working on the early Chaplin films, and they had taken those. I mean, the early before he made feature films. And they had they had uh, restored them, and now they're available. Um, and so it's you know films of that tier. Well, this, and I should also say as well, if I haven't already, that Lassie Lou had never starred in a film before, and this was the only time she starred in a film. Um, her other, like I guess you would say, co-stars was a, a young um, actor named Frankie Darrow, um, and then they were the child characters in this movie. Um, and then there were two adults as well. Okay. Um, and so before we got on air, you had mentioned to me, well, I've never seen that film before. I've never seen L- Little Mickey Grogan. Well, I haven't either, and neither has the world for 87 years that I know of. So um, wanting to make Lassie happy, but also wanting to be a kind of one of a better term. Maybe this is too romantic, although I believe in what I'm saying, um, a kind of guardian angel to rescue one silent film from oblivion. Now, let me take a pause and give you some, like some, some statistics, some background. Uh, Just over a year ago, the library of Congress, a guy named um, David Pierce at the library of Congress went through all, I, I don't know how much work this took, but anyway, he, he, he went through all the, the films that we have of the silent era. He, he cataloged them, and then he did 
he referenced them and he did like a, a study analysis about the state of silent films because it, it's quoted like, well, there's this percentage are left, this, this percentage are gone. Well, he wanted like real numbers. So he did his study. He published it. You can get it. It's free. You can just get it online. Um, and he saw that 70% of all American silent films are gone. But even that comes with a caveat because he only looked at feature films, not short films, just feature films after 1912. So um, i got a question for you, Jake, to bring in this conversation. This, <laughs> is, this has been such a monologue. And that is, what year do you think the first film was filmed in Nevada? In Nevada? Good question. Um, let's say um, I'm going to have to go with either the very late of uh, the 1890s or early 19. So let's say 1899 I'll go with. You're damn close. <laughs> You're damn close. I'm surprised because most people are, get it really off. They say like the 1920s. Um, well, considering that Russia did not make their, their first film until 1908 – uh, Nevada's was, and you can get, you can see it on YouTube. It's from, uh, 1897. And there was a very famous fight in Carson City. Um, there wasn't even a Las Vegas back then in 1897. Um, or there was, there was a couple houses. And, um, it was the Corbett Fitzsimmons. And you have to, uh, fight. And you have to understand that, you know, there was no, you know, Olympics back then. There was not a lot that unified the world. And so this fight captured in fact, it's actually alluded to, if you know the Alfred Hitchcock film, um, The 39 Steps, at the beginning of the movie. And so, yeah, so our first film is 1897. And it's, it's, it's very short. It was made by Thomas Edison, uh, his, his, his people. And so, um, so there's 70, going back to what I was saying, there was 70% of the films are lost. And I would just like to be able to save one. And so, but um, I'm a film restoration virgin. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm a academic who, you know, has never done producing before. And, um, um, but I've got all the will, the vim and vigor of, of wanting to do this and, and, um, very, um, moving forward and not taking no on an answer for, for anything. And so I've got that in my, I've got that in my, um, in my corner as well as, as Lassie Lou herself. So, um, fortunately, again, without going into stories here, um, I was able to meet up with um, a man, it was quite by accident, um, named Eric um, Grayson. And Eric Grayson does have um, a reputation and, and success, um, a man from Indiana in the area of film restoration. He particularly likes movies which we call orphan films. They, you know, that means films that, that, um, that are not, it's not a Lon Chaney movie, it's not a... You know, it's not a Mary Pickford film, so because if one of those films were, were found, believe me, money would find it, a way to fund that. Mm -hmm. But you know, Lassie Lou was never a star, and even Frankie Darrow was never a star. So this would this would disintegrate. I remember um, Bromberg telling me in that same email, he said, if we were around for three hundred years, that I remember him writing that, that this wouldn't get restored. So, and that, not saying that he didn't want that, but that it just, you know, it's overwhelming. So that's what I've done. I, I've started, um, the first step of this, um, uh, this restoration is a campaign to raise money um, on GoFundMe. And what we're doing is simply this. We are taking that original camera negative and then we are, um, we're going to digitize it in 2K. We wish it was 4K. Gives you the resolution would be that much better, mm -hmm. but in 2K <clears throat> it's still it's still doable, and that would keep the film in Paris. You wouldn't have to move it to the United States to be able to do that, which is of course money. And then that copy will be sent to me, and then I will send it um, to a place in New York City for them to do the actual physical restoration, like take out everything that's bad and um, and and. Um, and, and, and go that way. And that, that's the biggest, most expensive part of it. But the initial part is just getting the film from film to a digital Did copy. You? And so I'm happy to say, at least as of now, 
Um, and this has been going on about two weeks. I haven't checked the days. I think it's been about two weeks. Um, twelve I, days. Twelve days. Okay, twelve days. Mm-hmm. Um, that something like 91, 92% of the, of the funds have been raised. And we're only looking at a modest um, $1,500. Okay. Um, and then that will get us going. So that's step one. And so um, we're still looking at what? How much more money? $125. Yeah. So, um, and I've made the pledge or the promise that if, if for anybody that gives $10 or more, that um, their name will appear. And this happens now commonly because as the, the funding to the arts has been drastically cut everywhere because we're living in this stupid age of austerity. Um, that um, your name will be uh, in lights at the end of the film as a contributor, as somebody who has donated money to do this really worthwhile thing is to save a movie that would otherwise certainly not be saved. Um, I think I've talked about it a lot here on Chasing Cinema. I'll give Jeff a minute to catch his breath and uh, take a drink of water because, you know, but uh, I can listen to that man talk all day. Um, Is that I do this because I don't want to... I don't think my opinion is higher than anyone, and I don't think that what I say is what's right when it comes to film. But it's because I love movies, and I love everything that they stand for and what they've done and how they've affected me. And, and, you know, there are people who will see a movie, and they'll make it laugh, and they'll forget about it. But there have been movies that I've seen that have changed me as a person um, and really affected me. I've, I mean, um, you could listen to our conversation about silent film and how deeply those movies have moved us both. Um, we talked about the passion of Joan of Arc and uh, many other films that just speak to us on volumes that are so heavy. So to me, you know, uh, the ability that we have to save a bit of that history that we care so much about is one of the greatest things in the world. So the fact that you're able to do that and, you know, you are doing that is absolutely incredible. And I cannot thank you enough just as a movie lover For what you're doing, because it's possible, you know, that down the line through this process, I'll be able to watch this film and many more people be able to watch this film. And this film might speak to somebody down the road and change their life. And that might sound really romanticized, you know, but it's true because I've seen films that not many people have even heard of that have affected me emotionally. You know, we there are these great silent films, as we were mentioning. They're the ones that, you know, will always be above, you know, the rest and people reference and stuff. But there are other films, and, and, and you know, depending on how much of a cinephile you are, you'll go hunt for them. And that's why, if no one ever knows, that's why this website is called Chasing Cinema, because we are constantly looking for that movie that could possibly change your life through archives and stuff like that. So... If you are just beginning this journey of falling in love with movies, and I, I I really hope, and I'm sure Jeff will agree with me here, is to go back as far as you can and see the things that have brought us to where we are today. And there are films like this that we might not be able to see, 70% that we might, um, that we'll never see. And we have ability to save at least a few of those, a handful of the many that we've lost, and eventually see them. So, I mean, I had him on here not because he's my friend, not because I think he is been one of the biggest mentors I've ever had when it comes to to um, learning about film because of how important this cause is. Yeah, you might not have ever heard this movie and, you know, might not have ever heard of the star. You know, it's not something that you might even, you might not even have seen silent films or, or gotten into that. You just might be a movie going, like to hear what I say about recent films. But this is what the importance is. This is where this becomes, stops from being entertainment, but to art and history. And we have to preserve art. Uh, that's that's why critics are important. That's why scholars are important. And that's why um, I hope one day I have the same knowledge and influence as Dr. Krauss once has. Because he he has, obviously, if you heard him speak, you know how much knowledge he has about film and how much he cares. And, and I have that same passion. Uh, but I don't have the same knowledge. But I'm, I'm trying my best to get there. Um, so please... Um, as you're listening to this, pull up your web browser and go to gofundme.com slash nwq8h4. That's nwq8h4. 
and donate now, please. Um, Dr. Krauss, do you know if, if you make over that amount, you'll get to keep that and that'll no, go through? I, I don't know because this is all new to me. Um, okay. Can, can, I, can I do something? I, I want to – I'll talk more about this because there's there's actually a little bit more to talk about so that you can kind of find out what the process is. But let me let me get out of my project and 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 tell you about another project that is completely unrelated to me. Um, that is that is that is that is you know as much as I'm devoted to this saving this movie, there's I have no illusions either. You know that there as I've mentioned before there are you know there are other stars there are other films that that would rank higher just as Bromberg has mentioned in Paris to me. But um, something that's an example where it's more than important and it's it's happening parallel to my restoration is restoration at Kino Lorber. And they're doing, not a GoFundMe, but it's like that, you know, crowdsourcing. And they have uh, they, they initially were going to take um, 40 days to raise $35,000. And they raised that way short of that very quickly. And now they're upping it to 60 or $65,000. What am I talking about? I'm talking about that. They have a chap named Brett Wood. And he's down in Atlanta and he has gotten with the uh, major American ar- archives, uh, library of Congress, UCLA, other places. And he has taken, and you may, again, your listenership may not know this. And yet this is so important that, you know, um, that often when we look at these old movies, and they are old, uh, these silent films, it's largely, although not exclusively, it's largely a white cinema. That is Caucasians, European Americans. Um, and then, you know, you, you wonder, well, what happened, you know, to at least the 12% of African Americans we had? What happened to that audience? Do we make films for that audience? And the answer is actually yes, that they, um, uh, African Americans got, um, um, very small stereotypical roles in mainstream Hollywood movies. So they got tired of that and they started making their own movies. And um, what this project is doing at Kino Lorber is they are um, gathering um, the, the core um, films, alternative cinema that was created for blacks by blacks in our history and it goes from the silent era all the way to the early 1940s so it goes does go to the sound era too and they're putting this in a, in, a, in, a, in a box collection and you know this would be wonderful as a teacher or as a film lover to be able to alongside your von sternberg and von strohein movies and murnau and dw griffith and those other um great artists in europe and america and elsewhere during the silent era that were mostly in the case of this country, white cinema to actually have this, uh, a, a supplementary black view of things where they were in, um, serial pictures where they were in Westerns, where they were in just all the genres, you know, white people were in. And this is a wonderful bit of American art that, that has been denied to so many of us. And with this funding, um, will be brought back to us and to the mainstream as well in a way that history has never allowed. And uh, it's so awesome that we are kind of talking about this now because uh, about two weeks ago I was interview I was on the uh, Corey Taylor talk show and that's the Vegas's only teen talk show and they were asking uh, they were talking about crowd uh, funding for a film that a filmmaker a new filmmaker wanted to make and I said you know it's an incredible time because we get to pick what we watch we can help uh, fund film and help the next filmmaker possibly the next you know great director make a movie and we also have the ability now to go back and save part of this history and again you know really see something that we otherwise would not be able to see. My mind cannot um, <clears throat> escape what Dr. Krauss said earlier about, you know, there's three people left that make this living history. And I mean that this, if maybe if that, she didn't mention this movie to you, this movie would be lost forever. That's how, sure. that's that to me is leaving me speechless and just trying to understand that there are films that could have just been lost by a simple question. And, you know, any project you could find like this 
or anything that represents film restoration or trying to protect these movies, I could not recommend and advocate more. You know, help new filmmakers, but make sure you also help the art and the world of motion pictures by donating and making sure these projects are restored. Yes, certainly. That's, 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 yeah, it, it's, it, I like with your point about like we get to choose and, um, these crowds funding or crowdsourcing places allow us to do that. Um, I've been humbled by all the people that have con con contributed to this, um, my particular, you know, um, endeavor and, um, people, I don't even know who they are. And that's just like, that is so cool. Um, let me though, just finish up and just, and then I'll, we'll be done with this. But, um, in terms of, you know, what is, what it, will this look like? Um, what, it, what are the, the aims or the goals of this? Well, um, to answer that, the end product I want, and I'm, I'm a Capricorn and an oldest child, which if you know, uh, either of those things means that I'm incredibly driven. And I don't, like I said before, I don't take no for an answer and have high goals. And my, I, I figure, you know, do it right or don't do it at all. So I want this to appear on a DVD. Um, that's for, um, to may, be made, you know, for, for popular consumption. I want this eventually to be on, um, Turner classic movies and, um, other movie centered, cinema centered, um, stations, uh, in other countries. I want this to be taken to, uh, foreign film festivals. I'm I'm sorry, silent film festivals. Um, two of which, the two greatest of which, um, out of the three, uh, two are in Italy and the third one's in San Francisco. The, um, the one that's held there in early June. And there's a lot of other, a bit, a bit smaller ones that are, that are in many ways as important. Um, and so, um, they're very eager to find, uh, movies that have been restored because, um, it adds, of course, variety. So I, I want a DVD of this. I want it to play to these various venues that I've already mentioned. And then on the DVD, I want bonus tracks. And I want a bonus track, for example, um, that will um, feature the actress um, introducing her own movie in the way that Lillian Gish used to do that for her own movies. When she was a very old woman, she would introduce The uh, the Wind or Broken Blossoms in about two and a half minutes um, from her memories. And then um, another bonus track um, I would like to have would be um, an interview of her Um if that means um, reproducing my printed interview that's coming up that would be published here this spring or a filmed interview. And the good news is it sounds like there will, I've earned, I'm, I'm obtaining funding from my college, which is Nevada State College, to be able to take a small camera crew and to go to Prescott um, very soon, um, next month perhaps or the month after, but very soon, in order to film these, these littler films. Um, again... Just taking advantage of the fact that, you know, she's one of the three surviving people and you might as well get that on good film. Absolutely. I mean, that that would be incredible, especially to have. And, you know, I know you you, you recorded your interview already, but to have mm -hmm. it actually on that DVD. So mm -hmm. um, now how I'm going to ask some basic questions here. Now, how long is our process looking now? So we, um, right now, as, as Dr. Kress, we're already in nine, the over 90% of making his goal of $1,500. And hopefully, um, by the time he's exceeded that goal, um, you know, and, um, but so after we get this fund, how, what's the process coming afterward where I know you explained what, but how long do you think we're going to be looking at that? You know, time wise, let me tell you. Okay. I, I, there's some things I can tell you. Like I said, I'm new to this. Um, but I can tell you a couple of things. Number one is I, I want to define, you know, of course the largest part of the monies involved will be the actual restoration. Um, I've been told by Bromberg, um, in another email, his most recent one, that, um, the image is actually in his, his words, very good, but the mechanical aspect of the shape the film's in isn't um and like the sprockets and stuff are all wrong and um he thinks there will be actually i forgot the figure but he put it in euros and i put it in in, in dollars but you know it's about fifteen thousand dollars let's just say roughly to make it into a, a restored film um now how do you find money for that well 
there is, there are funding groups. There is Martin Scorsese's Film Foundation, yes, um, which it does terrific work. And 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 fortunately, um, Eric Grayson, the guy that's working kind of alongside me uh, often on this, is actually obtained in his own work two grants previously. So he kind of knows how to 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 um, formulate the grant writing. And then there's the Library of Congress, I believe, has one. And of course, I could also do like a Kickstarter, but I'm feeling right now I want to do the go go the way of grants mostly. And there are two places within Scorsese's Film Foundation in which you can apply. There's two times during the year. Um, one we've already missed, and that's in late February. But the other one, I believe, is in October. And September, October, I believe it's October. And of course, I will be ready for that and submit that. And I would like to... I just think it would be an accomplishment to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, there's things, though, that you that you don't think about. And I didn't think about either uh, that go along with this. For example, the film, um, the intertitles for this copy are in French. They're not in English. So you would think, oh, okay, well, I'll find somebody that speaks good French, hmm. speaks French well. And, um, and they'll just translate this. Well, you know, you don't do it that way. The obvious problem being is if you have something originally in English and then you translate into French, well, something's going to be lost. And then you translate it from the French back into English. Now you're two steps removed from the original. Yeah. And you don't like that. Okay. So hopefully there's been a, a copyright uh, or there's it's been the, the screenplay has been placed someplace like the Library of Congress from which you can directly draw upon. Okay. Um, and so, and then also you have to raise money for what? You have to raise money for a film score. Okay. And the, and in the silent film world, there are, um, any number of really fine, outstanding, um, composers, but as with everything else, there's a hierarchy and certain, you know, composers are better for one kind of genre maybe, or, and they're better known. Okay. And so it kind of matters on what I'm trying to say is who does the score. And so you've got to allocate money for that. And so yeah, there's all these little, you know, other things that are not incidentals. They're, they're quite important. So just to verify that the money that we are raising now is just the, just the first step. Yes. Just to get the film digitized, correct? Yes, exactly. So, Perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it sounds, you know, oh, he's almost made it, you know, good, but it's, Farthest thing from the truth, we are just getting. Uh, well, he's just getting his foot off the uh, on the floor, or I don't. That wasn't necessarily the right expression, but you get what I'm saying. So, uh, but we are definitely want to follow you throughout this process, however long it takes. We we at Chasing Cinema are definitely in here to support you. We will always do what we can to help you, either promote, donate, whatever it may be. We want to make sure that we are uh, helpful as possible. Um, is there anything else you want to mention before we close up here? Um, again, I, I want to uh, advocate everyone because just in case they haven't reached their goal, and if they can keep the money that they make after fifteen hundred, uh, please, it'll still go to the film. It's uh, GoFundMe.com slash NWQ8H4. Again, that's GoFundMe.com slash NWQ8H4. Uh, just, just in closing, just two things, and they're very, very short. One is, is to thank you f and others, um, but and particularly for you in this case, for your support. It's just so nice to get this, you know, unsolicited people wanting to help you. You know, one could be cynical in the world, you know, uh, about how people are today, and 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 yet there's so many contrary examples of where you know people have a heart and a and a and a, and a, and a curiosity and a, and a passion to support. Others and I so I, I really want to I really want to thank you and all the contributors on this campaign toward that it's um it's been most gratifying. The other thing I want to say, the last thing I want to say is you know just to, just to let people know because this has not been said yet, none of this money goes to me. I will not make a penny from this. Um, this is a labor of love. And um, you know, as he said, this is all going towards the film. You know, he's not he's doing this because he cares about this medium that needs help in being preserved and him doing that is incredible um make sure to check out uh, our podcast we're going to be linking the gofundme page on twitter and facebook as much as we can it'll be on the description of this podcast um 
And as, and as flattered as I am for you to thank me, uh, you know, I will never be able to repay you for the knowledge you've given me and taking your time out to talk to me. I mean, uh, Doctor, like I said, I met Dr. Krauss for a little backstory really quick before we wrap up. Hollywood video. I was helping him through the classic section, and he just commented on how much I did know while we were in the cl- classic section. I was stunned section. how much you knew. <laughs> um, for like a 17-year-old, I was stunned. And, uh, you know, he eventually actually... Change, you know, help me choose a college as I had trouble of choosing where I should go to, to, to uh, pursue this career of being, um, you know, to really learn about the history of cinema more than actual filmmaking. And he has taught me and even the small conversations that we've had either on Facebook or um, just briefly on the phone. Um, he is t- taught even now, you know, in podcasts as we're talking about this project, the, the words he said, you know, have been such an influence and it is just someone that can always inspire me and motivate me and really just kind of revamp that passion though. It's not necessarily ever need to be revamped, but he really knows how to uh, make me emotional about the thing that we've, we both love and many others do as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping I will see you in June um, for Charlie Chaplin, they're going to be doing The Kid at Henderson Pavilion. Oh, they're doing The Kid this I, year. I didn't think they were doing another one, but they actually are. They're going to be doing The Kid on, on uh, oh, I believe, June I, 6th. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, <laughs> so, on June um, 6th. One thing I, I want to say, could you also, I'll give you the information, could you link the one, again, this has nothing to do with me, about the pioneers of African American cinema. Absolutely. We will cool. definitely do that. Um, for those who are really interested in this conversation, Jeff and I are part of a group on Facebook actually called The Silent Film Group group an incredible um mm-hmm. just group of knowledge and links people are always posting things that are so fascinating um <clears throat> just yesterday i saw someone post they were giving away just giving away just for someone who cared um about uh, it was a vhs collection of um bus i don't know if it was buster keaton or harold lloyd now uh just uh, older films and he just gave them away so i mean it's an incredible group go check out more there um Again, don't forget to go to donate to this great cause. Um, Dr. Krauss, thank you so much for taking your time to talk with us. Thank you so much for doing um, this preservation, this project, and more importantly, thank you for what you're doing for our medium and for the art that we love. Um, I really appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jacob Toronto. I am joined by Dr. Jeffrey Krauss. Please continue Chasing Cinema. 